Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, today we're going to take a look at a new channel, a channel that I've been getting recommended to me a lot. And I can honestly say, not only have I not seen this video, I've never seen any of their videos. I've never watched a single video from Overly Sarcastic Productions, but that's going to change today. So I don't know what to expect from their style or anything like that. Uh, but I thought this one looked pretty interesting. It's called Failed Assassinations. So we're going to dive into that. Starting tomorrow, we'll be doing our next patron requested series. And the vote overwhelmingly was for Extra Histories, Vlad the Impaler. So we're going to start that uh, series tomorrow. You can also expect during the week to see some more original content showing up on the channel. But let's go ahead and dive right into History Hijinks, Failed Assassinations by Overly Sarcastic Productions. As always, don't forget, check out the original content creator link is in the description. Diplomacy is complicated. You have to manage competing interests and work cooperatively to ensure the best communal outcome. But luckily, there is another, much more efficient option. Murder. Because once you leap over those pesky little speed bumps like the worth of human life, it becomes so much easier to solve your problems by just unexisting the people who disagree with you. You know. So there you had a, a perfect example probably of the uh, most m m uh, influential assassination in modern history that's the assassination of archduke franz ferdinand and his wife sophie uh, of hungary or of austria uh the austro-hungarian empire uh who were killed which is the event that leads directly to the start of world war one it's by just unexisting the people who disagree with you you know like a psychopath but despite the nominal simplicity of huck a javelin through his abdomen killing people can be surprisingly labor intensive and prone to mistakes especially when the target is some political bigwig so to have a laugh at the expense of some of the most notorious failed assassins let's do some history our first story takes us to the eastern edge of the Mediterranean at the tail end of the Roman Republic, which was perilous for everybody involved. If you weren't Roman, you were always in danger of being conquered, and if you were Roman, then it's likely you were in the middle of an active civil war. And that's absolutely true, and not only that, but assassinations were a regular part of Roman history. Just look down the list of emperors of Rome and how many of them were killed. I mean, it's a pretty regular thing. In such a politically hazardous climate, everybody was under threat of sabotage, and in 120 BC, King Mithridates of Pontus was poisoned by none other than his wife. Needless to say, the royal kiddos were spooked by the proposition of an arsenic sippy cup, so one of the princes booked it for the woods. While he was wandering around the Pontic wilderness building support for a coup, the prince decided to be proactive about the inevitable threat of poison. So whenever he stumbled across one of Anatolia's many poison-filled plants, animals, or minerals, he just ate it. The logic being that if he ingested all of the poisons imaginable in small doses, he could build up an immunity to it and become invincible. And now that's impressive because in the first century BC, you don't think about that being the kind of knowledge a person would have, that they could build up a tolerance to something. This is actually really reminiscent of uh, the Princess Bride, uh, when you have the famous Battle of Wits. Uh, only to find out that the one guy had built up a tolerance to the poison, so it didn't matter which cup he drank from. This is pretty interesting stuff here. So after seven long years in the woods getting blasted on tree frogs and vipers, the prince returned to his capital of Sinope and cooed his way into becoming King Mithridates VI. With crown on head and kingdom in hand, Mithridates set about doing two things, expanding his state to prepare against the Roman threat and doing way the hell more poison. And now that the king had graduated from his days of just eating stuff and seeing what happens, he was going to use his royal resources to be scientific about this. He built a series of poison labs to source more elaborate ingredients, wow. test new concoctions on prisoners, develop tailored antidotes, and of course, get more poison to snack on. No, his highness the king does not have a poison addiction. He can stop anytime he wants. <laughs> but why stop when he had baller party tricks like gulping down snake venom? Now the thing is, part of me feels bad for memeing so hard on Mithridates because he was an extremely learned king who collected massive libraries, could speak well over a dozen languages, and grew his small kingdom into a Black Sea empire. But on the other hand, funny haha -ha poison man, so my hands are tied. <laughs> Mithridates likely survived several assassination attempts, but we'll never really know how many because none of them worked. Of course, like everybody else in the ancient Mediterranean, his downfall was Rome. His yeah. grand strategy was to incite a revolt in Western Anatolia and Greece to let disgruntled Romans do what they do best. The so the whole time he's worried about a threat from within, a uh, suicide, I mean not a suicide, an assassination attempt, 
And the real threat is, you know, the Roman Empire knocking on his door on the west coast there. Confusion of mass slaughter made great cover for Mithridates' march into Roman territory, and he managed to get in a spirited back and forth for a good two decades before Rome stopped compulsively slapping itself in the face and actually started trying. Eventually, General Pompey, soon to be Pompey the Great, later Pompey to be Magnus. Pompey the Headless, stomped the Pontic army and forced Mithridates- Wait, did he say something about him being headless? Pompey, soon to be Pompey the Great, later to be Pompey the Headless, stomped- All right. I, I gotta admire that one right there. Pompey, uh, during his civil war against Caesar, flees to Egypt, gets beheaded. The head is presented to Caesar, who flips out and gets really upset because you don't do that to a consul of Rome. The Pontic army and forced Mithridates to flee across the Black Sea to Crimea. After failing to raise another army, he decided it was better to just die than to get paraded in a Roman triumph. So, with his back against the wall, Mithridates killed himself by poison. Except he did not, because he was immune. Plan B was asking a friend of his to do him a solid and just stab him. It's lucky he didn't supplement his daily poison regimen with doses of tiny knives, or else he really would have been screwed. And so, King Mithridates died as he lived. <laughs> Not dying from poison. Now, wow. trying to kill one king is enough of an endeavor, but as time goes on, administrations evolve and power often gets distributed to a much wider base. This makes it infinitely more difficult to off an entire government at once. But luckily, Fifth the 1600s November. are a wonderful time full of such modern marvels as high explosives. So we're going to talk about the gunpowder plot, which is much, much more familiar than the previous one we just talked about. And some enterprising lads wanted to make use of this new tech. So let's set the scene. England has been ruled by Protestants for nearly a century, and they were making life increasingly suck for the English Catholic holdouts. And since England's Anglican monarchs kept butting heads with very Catholic Spain and- Now Henry VIII would not have considered himself a Protestant. He considered himself a loyal Catholic. He just was, a, in his mind, a Catholic that didn't want to be under the authority of Rome. Uh, as far as the church goes, he wanted to remain staunchly Catholic. It's really only under his son, Edward VI, and then especially under uh, Elizabeth, who comes to power after Edward, after their sister Mary, that you really get what we would consider today the Church of England and, and a strong break from the Catholic Church. Getting excommunicated by the very Catholic Pope, <laughs> adherence to the Church in Rome was treated on par with being an enemy of the state. This was an extremely complex mesh of religious and political factors that would require a delicate touch to overcome. Or, or, blow up Parliament. No fuss, no persuasion checks, just an ass ton of explosives. That was the logic of these fine morons. Robert Catesby, Guy Fox, and ten other Catholics conspiring to destroy the Protestant government of England under the new King James I. So there's a movie that just came out not too long ago about this, uh, the gunpowder plot, and uh, I believe Kit Harington, who plays Robert Catesby, is actually, I want to say he's like a descendant of Robert Catesby or some kind of relative of him, which makes it really interesting. The scariest part of the story is that the plan might have worked if the conspirators shared more than five brain cells between them. For <laughs> yeah. instance, step one was renting an apartment next to the Palace of Westminster under the bulletproof alias of John Johnson, which must have made the landlord think, ah yes, Mr. John Johnson, he must have a respectable career of doing job at place. They then spent <laughs> weeks hauling 36 full barrels of gunpowder into the apartment in advance of Parliament's reopening. But boomifying an entire government body was only part of the scheme, as they planned to start a revolt in the countryside and capture the king's Catholic daughter to install her as a puppet queen. And lastly, they'd sail over to Europe to get the Pope to support the new Catholic government and pretty please forgive us for all of the murder. So that was the idea, but Parliament was closed for most of the year because of plague, <laughs> mood, and wouldn't reopen until November 5th. That left a lot of time for the conspirators to ruminate on the moral implications of terrorism. Not because murder was wrong or anything silly like that, but because they had some friends in Parliament. Wait, okay, can we talk about the fact that he only had three fingers on one hand, but he's got four on the other here. All right, now there's four on each. Okay. I'm still a little disturbed by the whole four fingers and not five thing. All right, anyway. Not because murder was wrong or anything silly like that, but because they had some friends in Parliament. So despite strict orders not to send any warnings to anybody, one of the conspirators sent a, hey, maybe don't go to Parliament note to his buddy. <laughs> Which is what throws the whole thing off. Can you imagine that? Hey. No, no reason in particular, but don't go to Parliament on the 5th of November. Just call in sick that day. No reason. I don't know anything. There's certainly not any plot to kill everyone. Just don't go that day. 
Now this alarm bell wrapped in a red flag had the easily foreseeable consequence of getting reported straight to the Chamberlain, who proceeded to search the entirety of Parliament on the night before the plot. Imagine their surprise to find a lone gentleman standing next John to a Johnson. pile of firewood and 36 barrels of gunpowder in an otherwise empty apartment. A gentleman who insists that his name is John Johnson, esteemed doer of job at place. I'm sure Guy Fox was shocked the constable saw through his ironclad disguise. Fox was subsequently tortured into giving up the names of his co-conspirators who were busy up in the countryside failing to start their revolt. Unfortunately, their excess storage of gunpowder had gotten soaked, so these big brain boys laid it out to dry in front of a fire, which is just the most apt visual metaphor for a plant blowing up in your face. The crew was captured and executed, and for the next century and change, British Catholics were treated even harsher because of their association with a gunpowder plot. So Guy Fox, uh, he signed his name as Guido Fox. Uh, on if you look at his signature on his confession, it's like barely written well because he was he had been tortured so badly that he could barely write his name and they had to help him do it um so he's sentenced to be hanged drawn and quartered which is the normal uh sentence for uh people who have committed treason at that time uh, and the first part involves them hanging you until you're almost dead well he gets out of the really gruesome torturous painful parts to follow by jumping off the ladder to hang himself um break his own neck hang himself before they could do the rest of the stuff and it works. Plot, even losing the right to vote until 1829. Nice job ending that religious persecution. Good work, team. Now, Good I was originally team. going to wrap this video with a story of either Rasputin or Fidel Castro, but Rasputin did end up getting shot to death, so he's disqualified, and the only thing more numerous than the CIA's 600 assassination attempts on Castro is the amount of low-effort listicles about it. Instead, we're gonna ignore the rest of the world and cozy up in Venice. So, the Venetian Republic, the longest-lasting and best government in world history, I need not say more. But sometimes, rarely, the Serenissima made some tactical errors. In 1310, Venice had ruffled enough fat and feathers to earn themselves an interdict in which the Pope smacks the holy banhammer onto an entire city. This was bad news for a mercantile island republic with approximately four square feet of arable land. As the man in charge of this mess, Dojo Gradenigo, was immensely disliked and had to take draconian steps to quell all the unrest. In a dicey situation like this, Venetian nobles had the option to A, deal with it, or B, riot. So with the Great British Boom House still a couple centuries off, the Great British, British Boom House. Down? Well, it started with a handful of snippy nobles and won by a Monte Tiepolo, the grandson of a former doge and a man with no qualms about hucking the Republic off a bridge and installing himself as despot. These gents were all but certain that scores of Venetian nobles and commoners alike would join in their quest to stab the doge in the face, so they sent out a lot of feelers to their friends around town. But coo This is what you call not even trying to hide what you're about to do. You're sending out feelers to everybody. Hey, you interested in getting involved in this plot? We're gonna go kill him. Man, I mean, they weren't even thinking about Getting caught. is a strong word, and some people were distinctly not on board and did the responsible thing of reporting the conspiracy right to the doge. But even if the conspirators knew to expect a veritable party bus of guards, their more pressing concern was weather, namely the springtime lightning storms. See, their foolproof plan was to take two groups across town and raise the citizens to arms before meeting in St. Mark's Square to storm the doge's palace. But when they charged through the streets at dawn and started shouting, Liberty! Death to the doge! Nobody could hear them over the sound of thunder and pouring rain. And anybody who liked what these guys were selling weren't about to go running into a storm at 6 a.m. So, <laughs> bad timing. As history shows us time, and, uh, time again, stirring a populace to open revolt and killing a mark can be tricky. It requires calculated planning, persuasion, and many other skills. What was the rest of that? I gotta see the rest of that. Rain. And anybody who liked what these guys were selling weren't about to go- Stupid diplomacy getting in the way of the coup. Go running into a storm at 6 a.m. The West Group ran smack into a band of the Doge's guards and might have regrouped if not for some priests and painters on their way to work who took the initiative to waylay the conspirators a second time. Tiepolo's East Group had similar luck, gaining exactly zero sympathetic rebels. In fact, Venetians were opening their windows specifically to shout insults. And That's not awesome. to be outdone, one kind old Signora Rossi heard the commotion while doing her morning chores, and when she opened her window, she dropped, or maybe threw, her stone mortar at the conspirators, landing square on the head of the standard bearer and killing him instantly. Thus proving that she was more successful at killing someone than the conspirators had been. 
Tiepolo saw his comrade drop dead in front of him and took it as a sign that this was just not his morning. So he ran away and politely accepted his banishment. Meanwhile, old lady Rossi was hailed as a hero for her ingenuity and impeccable aim. As her reward, she simply asked to fly a Venetian flag on feast days and for her landlord to never raise the rent on her family home so long as the Republic endured. Nice. Now this was a god tier play, because Venice yeah, took was. the conspiracy as a hint to reform, to better avoid future treason, but also to improve the government's overall efficiency, which combined to give the Venetian Republic another five centuries of life. I mean, sure, Tiepolo and his conspirators made a series of fatal mistakes in their slapdash plot to kill a doge, but oh boy, if they only knew that Signora Rossi was waiting for them, those fools would have stayed the hell home. Yeah. So, aside from some boring nerd morals about how murder isn't a cure-all, what have we learned today? Well, Mithridates should have been more careful with what he wished for in his poison immunity, so the rest of us should probably lay off the arsenic and stick to alcohol as our poison of choice. Meanwhile, Guy Fox is proof that the best laid plans are only as strong as your dumbest nickname. And finally, Divine Smite comes in many forms, and Old Venetian Ladies with Stoneware is a good one to look out for. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's talk about a couple of other failed assassination attempts. And since he didn't talk about any more recent ones here in the United States, I'll throw a couple of them out there. Um, obviously, probably the most famous one among uh, failed assassination attempts uh, among U.S. presidents has to be when Theodore Roosevelt is running for uh, re-election. This is after he's already been president, has stepped down. William Howard Taft has become president. Now Roosevelt's running again. Uh, and he gets shot in the chest while giving a speech. Finishes the speech. And I'm not talking like he had a paragraph to go. I think he spoke for like another 40 minutes with a bullet in his chest. And this is where he, he very famously comes uh, gives the nickname to his third party run, the Bull Moose Party, because uh, he makes a comment about how it'll take more than that to take down a bull moose. Um, but he finishes the speech, and you know, just you know, as he's talking like god tier level stuff right there. Uh, there was an attempt on Andrew Jackson when he was president of the United States, and the guy, uh, the the gun misfired, and Jackson started beating the guy with his cane. Uh, there were multiple assassination attempts on Gerald Ford when he was president. Uh, very famously, one of the uh, Manson, Charles Manson followers, Squeaky Fromm, tried to shoot him. Uh, not a lot of people know that when George W. Bush was president, there was actually a dude, I think he was in Ukraine or Russia, uh, and some dude rolled a grenade up on stage where they were. I uh, didn't go off, but uh, you know there have been a lot of failed assassination attempts over time. Somebody took a shot at Lincoln years before he was assassinated, uh, so it's been a pretty common thing. And if you have any others that you think are particularly interesting failed assassination attempts throughout history, go ahead and write them down uh, in the description below. Franklin Roosevelt was very famously almost assassinated. I think the assassination attempt on him did kill someone else. Let me look that up because I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. So this is the guy here, Giuseppe Zangara. Um, he was born in Italy. Uh, he died at the age of 32 in the Florida State Prison. He was executed by electric care uh, chair. That's what it was. During a night speech by Roosevelt in Miami, uh, Zangara fired five shots with a handgun he had purchased a couple days before. He missed Roosevelt, but instead injured five bystanders, uh, killing the mayor of Chicago. Uh, so, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Uh, so, if, the, if you can think of others, use the comment section below. Let's have a conversation about failed assassination attempts. Would be interesting maybe sometime uh, to see some videos, or maybe I'll do one myself, about what might have happened, how world history might have changed if one of those assassinations had been successful. For example, this one. What if uh, Roosevelt had been killed in 1932? Uh, during all of this. That would have been really interesting stuff. So uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.